Welcome back, Proximians, to Terra Proxima. It's been a month since my last video, and since then, some scientists have decided to jump in and help me with the research. We went through research paper upon research paper, correction dated, I have no fucking idea what the papers say, and I put it all into some more neat episodes for you people to watch. Today I'd like to talk about Earth, the home of the now extinct humans, and just how they went extinct, as well as discuss any possible survivors of the impact. Earth these days is a popular tourist attraction for many Proximians. It's only 0.0000000047454701026772677 Proximillions away from Proxima Centauri B after all. The reasons to visit the fabled land of our ancestors range from I want to learn about the lives of the magnificent humans led before they were all scorched to death to I want to get as far away as possible from my job so my boss can't reach me, even though I know well that this is far from the farthest place I could go. It's not your relaxing type of vacation. You'll need to take many precautions to visit a place that is now as dangerous as nearing the atmosphere of a neutron star. Ever since the asteroids twice the size of Centra Proxima and with an estimated volume of 33.51 cubic kilo chicxulubs hit Earth, an alarmingly hot sea of lava has caused all sorts of problems on the surface. You see, humans were very keen on digging massive holes in their planet. Just before they got snapped into the abyss, humans discovered that atomic modules could be used to eradicate huge portions of mass in seconds. This allowed them to dig a hole so deep it almost reached the bottom of the lower mantle of Earth, which is about 540 kilo chicxulubs deep. What they did not discover was that this was a terribly terrible idea, especially if an asteroid were to land right in the crater. They didn't have to wait too long to discover that, however. The final remaining humans were lucky enough to see lava from the Earth's core spew out of the Anuvu quarry. When Proximians visit Earth, they are advised, not obligated, to stay within the safe perimeters set by the Centra Proxima Traveling Agency. Over 410 deaths caused by incidents near the Anuvu quarry have been recorded. I expect this number to rise after this episode is done airing. Let's rewind time to before the humans went extinct. What was Earth really like for them? Earth itself had an approximate volume of 8 billion cubic kilo chicxulubs. The average temperature on Earth was about 287 degrees freezer, perfect for human life to flourish. You might then wonder why humans, or better, human cells, managed to survive and thrive on Proxima Centauri b. The answer is quite simple, assuming you have a degree in biochemistry. The humans did not send their own cells here, they sent a bunch of cryogenically frozen bacteria to our planet. Bacteria are known to have an ability to survive very tough conditions, including very cold and very hot climates. The average temperature in Centra Proxima, our capital, is about 234 freezer. A temperature difference of 53 freezer can be survived by bacteria, but not under an immediate switch. If you take a bacteria from Earth and you place it straight on Centra Proxima, it has no chance of surviving. You have to give it time to adapt to lower and lower temperatures. This is something the humans thought of, they called it Tardic Temperature Adaptation. We called it the principle that helped us exist, because without this genius invention, the bacteria would have perished in nanoseconds. Back to Earth now, I already mentioned Earth's huge size before. But that big volume doesn't mean a big amount of people can live on a planet. 71% of Earth's surface is covered by large stretching oceans. There are many solutions to this problem. You could invest in hydro technology so you could live underwater and create sprawling underwater cities without damaging the environment, but humans only dreamed of this in movies and myths. In actuality, they ignored the oceans and tried putting everyone on land, and faced the consequences that caused. Scientists speculate that overpopulation on Earth was the cause for, well, everything the humans did wrong. It caused them to form alliances, countries and more, which in turn led to wars between those alliances and countries. It led to a lack of materials and food for all those people, which meant only rich people got access to a small amount of food and materials, which meant a lot of people were poor, which meant a lot of people died of unfortunate causes. If you think for long enough, you can probably connect overpopulation to the extinction of humans. But the scientists said it's not a good idea to give the pessimists any ideas here. 
the life of a human was pretty structured and prepared for them. If you were born in any highly populated area, which was about like 70% of the time, your life followed a structure similar to this one. In your first few years you learn how to walk, talk, eat chalk and not shit all over the place. Before you write an angry letter saying I'm spitting straight nonsense and that no civilization could be this slow at growing up, I have to tell you that this is the non-fictional truth. It took the average human about 3 years to understand a basic conversation and walk properly and at that point they couldn't even talk properly, write or comprehend any science whatsoever. This all changes when, at approximately the same age, humans start going to school. School is an institution you're forced to go to for up to 8 hours a day to learn mostly useless garbage and some interesting stuff you might be able to use later. But mostly useless garbage. In your first years of school you learn basic manners and basic things a living being should be able to comprehend. When you turn 5 years old you enter the next stage of school. Now they're gonna teach you how to write, read, do maths, learn history, learn geography, give horrible presentations and so much more. This is a lot at once for young humans, this is regarded as the phase where most of them go off the path and turn out to be dumb morons for the rest of their lives. It is especially mathematics that is hated universally by children of this age. They don't yet see the purpose of the numbers, the calculations, the formulas and so on. Luckily for them, they'll realize it too late when they've already been squashed by an asteroid they could have prevented a collision with if the children were more interested in what they learned. And also if the way in which they learned it was better. When you've gone through a few years of that, the schools start dividing you into groups more based on your interests and what you're capable of. But they'll never stop giving you maths, oh no, there is always maths. When humans turn 18 years old, we're skipping over a lot here, they get to study one more specific topic for 3 to 4 years that they then want to keep themselves busy with for the rest of their life. Or they could just stop after that and get a job that no one likes. After that, humans spend about 40 years going to work, which earns them money, having a family, paying taxes, having depression, paying medical bills, becoming ill, dying and so much more fun stuff. Especially that last one, they really loved dying. Most humans lived for 70 to 80 years before their ancient body parts finally gave up. Some even lived for over a hundred years. Truly fascinating. Now that we have set the stage for what humans are all about, let's take an in-depth look into what happened when humans realized they were about to die. One day, a scientist at NASA ran the DART program to check for objects heading toward Earth's atmosphere. The DART program uses dozens of satellites placed near the atmosphere that checked for any unclassified objects. On that faithful day, the program found a very large unclassified object that it recognized as a big asteroid. At the time, the program was unable to calculate the atmospheric resistance of the object, so it wasn't known if it would burn up in the atmosphere or not. They just hoped it would and didn't tell the public a single thing. On yet another faithful day, they realized the asteroid wasn't burning up in the atmosphere and that it would collide with them in approximately 5 days. The news quickly spread and every human, except those without access to any form of communication, started freaking out about their soon to be deaths. Luckily the humans had been prepared for a scenario like this and they built evacuation bunkers underground where they presumed they'd be safe from a collision. They were right, but they didn't think of the problem that was about to end them all, overpopulation. You see, because everyone assumed events like this were one in a billion, they never calculated just what percentage of Earth's population could be stored properly in these bunkers underground. When they did calculate it 3 days before the asteroid landed, they found out it was only like 4.2% of the entire population. If they were to stuff the bunkers full of them and disregard any comfort at all, they could maybe fit about 10% of all humans in the bunkers. This was a real disaster, and nothing could be done to prevent it in only 3 days. The only thing they could do was send out a rescue capsule, aimed towards the nearest, perhaps habitable planet, and store as many people in the bunkers as possible. We now enter the first phase of the impact. The direct consequences were pretty straightforward. Anyone who wasn't in the bunker and in a few hundred kilo chicxulubs from the impact site immediately died from either heat, radiation, pressure or all of the above. Even bunkers within about 50 kilo chicxulubs were useless since the heat was so unbearable there that it would melt the toughest of metals the humans had so far discovered. It also didn't help that the asteroid hit the area with the largest population density on earth, 
a country they called India. The second phase took a bit longer, but it's just as gruesome and killed way more. A dark foggy cloud spread in front of Earth's atmosphere, preventing sunlight from coming in. This alone killed almost all the wildlife and plants you could find. The dark cloud didn't cover the entire atmosphere though. It had a limited radius. Anybody who found themselves in this part of the Earth, a part they called Antarctica, was completely safe from any effects of the impact, except maybe a couple of earthquakes. This second phase killed humans not only from lack of food, but also from toxic gases. Somehow they fit 12% of all humans in the bunkers, so about 28% of the human population was still alive on the surface. Many of them would die in the coming days, but others were more prepared and had lifelong supplies of food to get through. They wouldn't survive forever, it would just take a while longer. Eventually, the carbon masks humans invented couldn't hold any longer, and everyone on the surface died too. This took about 3 months. The 12% of the humans in the safe bunkers weren't so safe after all. As I said before in the part about tourism on Earth, lava started erupting straight from Earth's core, into the impact site located near the deepest hole humans ever dug. The core is so full of so much lava that it created an ocean of it that covered about 8% of the Earth's surface. Since that 8% near the impact site is full of bunkers, more than 2% of the bunkers were either completely burned down or became so hot that it was inhabitable. The other 10% of the population had their own problems. They were running out of food in their little bunkers and very quickly. In the case of 2% of those humans, their bunkers were self-sustainable, meaning they could grow new food in them. But they weren't made for so many people, so half of them had to die before they had enough food to stay alive. In the case of the other 8% of the humans, their bunkers weren't self-sustainable. When they ran out of food, there were only three options. You could die, get out of the bunkers in hopes of surviving a bit longer on the surface, or start eating each other. The second option would sadly yield the same result as the first one, and the third one was widely regarded as a terrible idea. The remaining 1% were now settled into self-sustainable bunkers all over the earth. After a while, even these bunkers couldn't keep themselves running, since there was no more power supply and a lack of water coming in. Five months after the impact, the first humans exited their bunkers. The black cloud had vanished in most other regions, but not in the inner regions closer to the impact. The bunkers that were opened there were filled with toxic gases and the rest is history. So cool, they were now back on the surface, but everything was gone, everything was destroyed. All the animals were dead, all the plants were dead, and anything else they could eat was now rotten or destroyed. You at home might be thinking, well if they managed to evolve from apes climbing in trees to humans living in an advanced civilization, they should be able to rebuild, right? But you're wrong. Everyone who had survived up until this point was either extremely rich or were extremely lucky because they had access to the best bunkers. Which people aren't the kind of people who know how to rebuild society and start from the ground up. It was now 9 months past the impact. There were about 5 humans, presumably in Antarctica, who were probably scientists. They heard the news and they felt the impact, but they felt no effects to their health. They also had to go back very urgently because they couldn't stay there forever. 10 months after the impact they decided to go back to Earth, all 5 of them together. It was 3 male humans and 2 female humans. To this day we do not know whether they are alive or not. And with that depressing mystery, I'm ending off this first real episode of Terra Proxima. I hope you enjoyed watching, and I also hope you'll tune in next time. Thanks for watching.